Hello, Bill. Hello, Sandy. Hmm, an interesting situation for us this evening because we've already recorded this once. Didn't this happen once before? <laughs> um, hello, viewers. Anybody out there watching? I've had a really bad day and I started reading something that was wrong and I only realized halfway through, which is really weird because the thing that we're doing tonight is actually speaking of a poem speaking of a song, speaking of a very short quote from one of my favorite novels, and then something that is very personal to me right at the end. And I was so freaked out by having read something wrong that I actually hung up on Bill and had to talk True. myself off the ledge. <laughs> so this is take two. But I want to repeat the sentiment that I did start with in the original, which is that I've missed you, Bill. Two whole weeks have passed by since last we spoke in this forum. Too long. Too long. Um, but I will also repeat uh, that I was really inspired by what you encouraged me to do the other week when you played love songs and that you wanted to share that expressed your notions about, about love. And I, I thought it was a really excellent way for us to kind of dig deep into things again because I of course really enjoy speaking to you about visual art um, and of course we'll continue to do that but I think there's a lot more scope actually for two friends who get along and who enjoy talking to each other to talk about many things whether anybody watches it or cares I don't know but we'll give it a go again that's it's irrelevant we're here and some people love it so so tonight the title it's just speaking yep. of. It's, 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 it's very open-ended. <laughs> it is. Do you hate it? No. It makes really? me a little uncomfortable. You're going to have to talk me off the ledge, but. <laughs> okay. Well, first thing I want to open with is a poem. And it's by a poet I think is really significant, vital, in fact, in 20th century um, literature, poetry. It's E.E. E. Cummings. You pointed out to me before about the, the capitals, the E, E and the C. I did. Um, I was hoping, you know, in restarting this, you would have changed them to lowercase. But... <laughs> no, no, but I should have done. And of course, notice in the quote I've put here, um, which is from his very well-known poem, Anyone Lived in a Pretty How Town, that there's no punctuation. There's no capital letters. Um, and so the normal kind of values or credence that we give to literary form is kind of upended here. And, and that's something that's really fabulous and fascinating about Cummings and the way he, he wrote. And he was a, a maverick. You know, he was he was a pioneer, really. Yeah, it's it's it's. There's there's a thing, especially reading this little chunk of a poem, which I will let you read in your, you know, your your, your northern accent there, uh, it, uh, in a moment. But I, something I kind of came to me just now is that I think in poetry, oftentimes it's almost as if it's constructed into new words that are created with combinations of words that we know mm. that. You know, bird by snow doesn't mean anything, except it can mean something in your brain when you hear it and in context. You see what I'm saying? Where that's not really, a, it's not, it's, it's not really an obvious meaning necessarily, but in context, bird by snow and stir by still, it's, these, these are things that are in some ways sort of nonsensical, but they have meaning in context and almost like you could put parentheses around groups of words and they become like little capsules of conceptual thought yeah that are just like strung together does that make sense it does and and i love that i love that because of the liberty of that the freedom within that that um you know there's lots of things that i understand about words, you know, I use words every day in my teaching life. I write frequently myself. I write lots of content for courses and classes. 
and I write fiction and poetry myself too. And I know you write, and we're both chatterboxes. So we're using words all the time. And to be able to put words together in such a way that um, one makes joy spring from so little or the depth of sadness come forth from really nothing. It's such an extraordinary magic. Yeah, it? I mean, it, it's, it's a very particular world that you dive into, especially with poetry, I think. You did, I, I've said that I would try not to do this, but I do want to go back to something you said on recording one, which nobody else shall ever see. Um, you mentioned something about through the distillation of language, mm. um, you find it perhaps harder to get real purchase on, on what's being said. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's an efficiency in po poetry in general, um, wherein there's nothing in there that doesn't need to be there. You know what I mean? That's sort of the whole point is that it, it feels like even these four lines could be written out as four paragraphs, but somehow have been distilled down to four lines. And so that allows you to sort of put importance on things that maybe wouldn't be important if you're reading them as prose. It would just be part of a larger thought and maybe a way to get it across. But by the time it becomes poetry like this, you could tell that in this case, Cummings specifically decided what words and in what order and what to remove. And it's like, as much as you could get out, it, it, did you ever see, there's a documentary about the making of Springsteen's Born to Run, which I don't know if you're a Springsteen fan at all. Mm -hmm. um, it's, in my opinion, the best Springsteen record. And I'm not a huge Springsteen fan, but that record's amazing. But there's a documentary about it and they show him in his lyric books and how it's like lines crossed out and rewritten and rewritten, rewritten. It's the, like the entire album has been written six times in order to distill it down to exactly what it needs to be and nothing more. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's a very, you know, sort of, commoner version of of poetry in some ways uh uh that that is that i think is is trying to get across the same concept as 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 you're getting at here um but go ahead read i want to hear so i mean the excerpt i've put here i'm going to read the longer poem um and i'm just going to share what did happen earlier actually and the reason why i completely freaked out i'd printed out something else from some literary page about Cummings. Because I was, I was feeling a bit nervous actually talking about literature because though I write, I'm not a, a literature scholar. You know, I didn't do an English degree much as I would have really liked to try and <laughs> cram one in as well with all the other qualifications that you like to make fun of. Um, and <laughs> um. So I'm nervous in that, you know, I'm very aware in a public forum like this, even with our very limited audience, the fact is there may be people listening. Of course, there'll be people listening who know so much more than I do and who may have studied Cummings in depth, which I have not. Anyway, what happened before is I printed out a summary and I was reading the summary as if it was the poem. And I was so intent on reading perfectly. This is, I think, this is a very funny thing just to look at in oneself. I was so intent on reading perfectly and making sure that my meter and my measure and my voice, the cadence was right, that I'd actually lost what I was reading. And so I got about halfway through and I had- I don't think that that's odd at all, by the way. I think that, I don't know that you can actually think about words like these at the same time as you are reading them out loud, thinking about how you're reading them. I think that those are two very different concepts. Maybe, but my point is, is that I lost the point. <laughs> my point is that I lost the point of what I was doing, because the point of what I'm doing is reading a very particular thing. Anyway, that's what happened. And I was at once embarrassed, though I know I don't need to be embarrassed in front of you. But also, I was just so thrown by that. I couldn't believe that I got all the way through it. <laughs> and, and suddenly, it's like It sounded lovely. Everything that I heard sounded great. So... <laughs> Anyway, okay, so this is uh, what I had intended to read. Do you know this poem, Bill? I do not, but that is pretty much the answer that I'm going to give to anything you talk about literary. 
Okay. Anyone lived in a pretty how town with up so floating many bells down. Spring, summer, autumn, winter. He sang, his didn't, he danced as did. Women and men, both little and small, cared for anyone not at all. They show, uh, sowed their isn't, they reaped their same. Sun, moon, stars, rain. Children guessed, but only a few, and down they forgot as up they grew. Autumn, winter, spring, summer, that no one loved him more, by more. When now, by tree, by leaf, she laughed his joy, she cried his grief, bird by snow and stir by still. Anyone's any was all to her. Someone's married their everyone's, laughed their cryings and did their dance, sleep, wake, hope. And then they said their nevers, they slept their dream. Stars, rain, sun, moon, and only the snow can begin to explain how children are apt to forget to remember with up so floating many bells down. One day anyone died, I guess, and no one stooped to kiss his face. Busy folk buried them side by side, little by little, and was by was, all by all, and deep by deep, and more by more, they dream their sleep, no one, and anyone, earth by April, wish by spirit, and if by yes. Women and men, both dong and ding, summer, autumn, winter, spring, reaped their sowing, and went there came sun, moon, stars, rain. See, the reason why I don't read a lot of stuff like this is because it makes me sad. <sighs> well, one meets one's expectation on the stair. I think um, a summation, you know, a summing up of what many of us might be or fear we are, which is that we don't pay close enough attention. We don't to ourselves or others to anything, Bill. Well, I think that that, that is there, you know, ideas and things regret, you know, um, dreams and goals and the shortness of life and the cyclical nature of life and the, um, the, the, the older you get and the more that you think about life, the sadder life makes me. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's the sadder, the concept of life makes me, um, you know, it's, it's both long and hard, but, but, but short and, 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 and as you put it, you know, there's, there's a certain amount of attention that, that, that you need to give all the time, but you can't in the same way that when you were reading your reading the poem, you weren't thinking about what the poem was saying because you were busy reading it. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of times people are busy living their life and forgetting what it all means and why they're doing it in the first place. Um, Do you think anybody has an idea why they're doing it in the first place? Wait, is this anybody or anyone? Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think that I think that it's interesting. I think that that there are people who are more conscious than others. I think that as a general rule, people are worried about their own life and less about yours. Um, I think that people, I think there are a lot of people who want to find meaning. They, they want meaning to be, to be explained to them or told to them because they don't want to find it on their own or they don't have any of their own. So they want to follow someone else's. Um, It, it, see, this is this is the thing. I, I I listen to things like the stuff you've just read me, and it just makes me want to curl up into a ball. Bill, I'm so sorry. No, I just it's it's not it's not that. It's sort of just a you know it, at a point at which you get if you dig deep enough into the meaning of life, its ultimate meaninglessness becomes 
more and more obvious. And but is I meaninglessness think, in the same yeah. way that we could supplant that with nothingness? Yeah, I mean, and and in you know, in, in a sort of calculus way, it's like it's approaching infinity, you know. Um, it, but you know, it's 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 like my friend, it's like my friend Joe and Han always say, it's it's you know the just some guy theory of of life, which is that in the end, everyone is just some guy. Yeah. Uh, you know, and no one remembers. Exactly. I do think, or I wonder at least. Are we all, we're all the same. You know, we've approached topics of kind of the universal before yeah. in, in our lowly way, in our unphilosophical, untrained, unscholarly way. You and I have rambled to it before. This idea that we may be actually not just together, but that we are all the same. And I'm not even talking about this in a Unitarian way nor am I necessarily talking about it in a, an idealist way. Yeah. Just that there is little separation. Uh, you know, there are experience is that are fundamental and are you looking up words, Bill? <laughs> yes, I am actually looking up a thing. Uh, uh, one of my favorite quotes that, that, that is going to be poignant in a moment. Go ahead. Oh, okay. I'm listening. I just had to look it up. But do you, okay, well, here's my question. Do you think that, do you think that all humans feel at the same sort of in level of intensity? I think if I was you, I would think and feel exactly as you think and feel. Right. I bet, you know, there's a certain, uh, the, the, the chunk that you read the first time around. Yes. As, as, as sort of a preamble to this side. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sort of, it, 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 both, it both had this sense of people live and people die and the world goes on and generations pass and more people live and more people die. And these people fade into oblivion or, or, or both, both, uh, meaning nothing and meaning everything simultaneously. Um, I like the I like the fact that I just said some really intense like two paragraphs and then your answer is yep that's that's correct. Um, and but there, but there is an inherent. Um, I feel like sometimes there is an inherent snootiness to to ideas like that in the sense that that. Um, some of the people in these poems are living this deep life and some of them have dreams that they haven't fulfilled and then others don't even know that those people exist because they're just going day by day and not really thinking about their own dreams all that much you know suspect, there's 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 in fact you're trying to make something snooty out of it but rather i would suggest it's more to do with um like the absolute opposite of that which is the leveler the leveling out of everything we are all of us yes we might have our individual fears and hopes and dreams or so we think but actually we meet all the same end we go to we all we all go to the same point don't we and um, yeah you know there's something Again, this word, this idea of like being free, so f freedom in well, there's a freedom in death, but um, I mean also in the very living sense of death, the kind of dying to the moment, dying to that which we think we know, dying to that who we think we are, um, and I think in Cummings' poems, you know he. He had a very um, particular view on this. I mean, he, he grew up in, I, I think, Unitarian church with his dad as a pastor. I can't remember if I've mentioned this on this recording or the earlier one. But then in, la <laughs> yeah. in later life, he became affiliated with transcendentalism. Um, he was inquiring constantly, I think, 
Um, but he did have he did have a strong faith, and he wrote about God a lot. Um, both as his sustenance, his his kind of spiritual sustenance, but also just the way of life. That God is the way of life, and that kind of religiosity is um, maybe unusual. Because it's not, um, this might sound weird, it's not necessarily like a Christian ethos, even. It's a, it's a, dare I say it, like a universal understanding of something else, other, that is actually not other or separate to us at all, is, is who we are. It's, it's interesting. I just, it's like in, in some of, I hear it as some people are zombies and some people are think too much is sort of the, the, some of the sense that I get. Uh, You do like these categories, Bill, don't you? But I mean, mean, actually Cummings did write this to, I don't know if it was poking fun at proletariat, but (laughs) it was. um, Yeah. I mean, that, that you're right. So that's what I'm getting at is sort of like this, some some people understand the level of experience they're having and some people don't. No, because just sort of I think in the poem actually, though that's what Cummings is doing in a way, there yeah. isn't a sense that there are some people, even though we've got anyone and no one who love each other, the fact is anyone and no one are universal characters. Sure. Right. So Yes. Well that that is the idea, but you have to if if everyone and no one are universal characters then who are the other people who are just living day by day and dying? They're the other anyone's and no one's. Oh, I see. You know, I think this is interesting. And, and, and to, wait, to, some, to, to, to some extent, the narrator and everyone and no one is are being, uh, uh, are ignoring the other people and their experience that they're having at, at any particular time. But still, does that separate them or does that make them just the same? Yeah, I don't know. It all makes me really sad. Uh, I'm sorry about that. I am. So- no, I, 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 it's no, it's fine. I'm just, I'm just saying, it's, it's, it's this kind of stuff. It just feels so um, melancholy. Yeah, and inevitable, and ultimately purposelessness. Do you know it's Purpose, funny the way that we attach meaning to language, isn't it? Because yeah, what are those two words you just said, purposelessness, and what was the other one? Uh, uh, inevitable. Hmm. So you you attribute sadness to those things. Yes, I do. Okay. It's it's funny. I do you mind do you mind if I read something just real quick? There's a a. You ever read Pearl Buck? No. Do you know who uh, Do you know who Werner von Braun is? Werner von Braun is a. He, he was the guy who designed the rocket that went to the moon, the Saturn V rocket. Um, but he also was a Nazi who designed the V2 rockets that landed on London. And after the war, during a thing called Operation Paperclip, the Soviets and the, and the US Operation Paperclip took all of these Nazi scientists and said, you guys aren't going to prison. You're too good at what you do. You should come work for us. Mm-hmm. And this happened on both sides. And so... In a lot of ways, Werner von Braun was this engineering genius who allowed us humanity to get to the moon, whatever. But everyone always thinks of him as this, oh, he's this bureaucratic engineering guy who didn't really think all that much about what he was doing and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. And after he died, they found a handwritten copy of what I'm about to read you in his personal effects that he copied out of a book. It's a Pearl Buck quote, and it says, I have this on my wall, by the way. Uh, The truly creative mind in any field is no more than this. A human creature born abnormally, inhumanly sensitive. To him, a touch is a blow, a sound is a noise, a misfortune is a tragedy, a joy is an ecstasy, a friend is a lover, a lover is a god, and failure is death. Add to this cruelly delicate organism the overpowering necessity to create, 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 So that without the creating of music or poetry or books or buildings or something of meaning, his very breath is cut out from him. 
He must create, must pour out creation by some strange unknown inward urgency. He is not really alive unless he is creating. Um, and, and so to, to answer your question, you know, is inevitability and meaninglessness sad for me? Yeah, that's, that's, you know, like burning in hell to me. Um, so I'm just going to make a point, though, that I think is, sure. uh, is relevant. So if I met this person and he were to say this to me, what you've just read, right? I would want to know why creativity is so lumbered with pain for him. In the same way that I asked you about inevitability being sad. Yeah. In the same way that I would question when we use words like love yeah. or when we use words, again, the idea of creativity. Um, these are words of everything and nothing. You used that beautiful phrasing earlier everything and sure. nothing, simultaneously uh someone truly creative someone truly creative is primarily human yeah and their humanness is the thing that makes them exactly the same as everybody else yeah i feel like they're perceived to be the creativity that i think is being alluded to here is actually maybe not what creativity is because we just ascribed a certain meaning to what creativity means in the context of somebody who might generate a lot of self-expression as outcome. Sure. Um, but actually something truly creative is vitality. It's the spark and that we give attention to that. Do you um, think, do you think, but I don't think everybody has that spark. I don't know that that's universal. Hmm. I think, I think there are other people who may very well have, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for, have a meaning that I, for one, can't understand. You know what I mean? There, there are plenty of people out there who find meaning in things that I don't understand at all. Um, and therefore, I also find meaning in a lot of things that a lot of people, other people, I guess, um, don't understand. Mm -hmm. and, but, th and that's fine. But, 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 but like, ultimately, I as one, <laughs> uh, want to die having th at least thought that my life meant something, that something is left behind that adds a brick to the wall. Otherwise, what's the point? So I can have these experiences in a very selfish way and then I die and then it doesn't matter anyway because all those experiences are gone. Well, that, that, experiences are gone. Yeah, so why have them they're in the first already. place? If you've already had an experience, Bill, they're gone. Yeah, my memories of them are there at least for a while. For you. Yeah, I, I'm really interested in this. Talk. It's all right. You can move on. Go ahead. Okay. Well, I don't know if this does <laughs> clearly now go into Joni Mitchell, but I'll give it a go. I have a friend, Andrew. Hello, Andrew. Who sometimes Hi, watches this show, and he also loves blue. He knows that I love okay. the album. Um, and he actually sent me this uh, the other day. Um, I think actually because of that article you were talking about. Yes, in the New York Times. Yeah, so um, anybody listening, if you want to go and look at the article in the New York Times, there's been a big kind of resurgence, I suppose, in interest in the sort of surrounding narrative about the production of Blue and, and yep. Joni Mitchell's kind of relationship to the album, but also to the relationship or in the relationships that created that album. Again, the word creativity bringing forth this, um, in my opinion, By the way, extraordinary album. Yep. It, it, it's interesting because a lot of the songs are about a relationship with Graham Nash that was falling apart. Mm. And even today, it's interesting. Here we are, what, 50 years later. Even today, 
when asked about it, Graham Nash seems very sensitive and kind of upset that he can't listen to a lot of these songs because they still upset him 50 years later. It's just kind of interesting how powerful these things can be, especially to individuals. I don't know about the individual. date on here, actually. I think, I don't know if Blue was released in 1971, but this song was written in 1967. I'm not sure. Yeah, that could be. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, it was uh, later. 17. But, but go ahead. Anyway, yeah, I'm, I mean, the, the part I that I've, I've chosen, you know, Andrew sent this to me as a text and it was kind of like, you know, how could you not guess the poet from this? And I do think of Joni Mitchell as a poet. Um, more, more than a songwriter? Do you make a distinction between those things? Not really. Okay. <laughs> Bill, I don't make a distinction between very much. <laughs> just in a giant she, melting she, pot <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> I, ju I just hear sandy saying lines and borders and things that's your thing that this, is, is, this is not how i work over no, here see, even there you go you're trying to give me a category yes i know i'm i'm, I'm creating categories even between you and I. stop <laughs> anyway jody mitchell wrote this song and i was going to play it for you but also the thing that made me have a bit of a freak out earlier was I couldn't work out. Is that I am a technical failure. I, I am a technical <laughs> failure. And Bill this evening really let me down. <laughs> because he couldn't play the song. I'll take it. I'll, I'll just, I'll take the hit. I'm falling on the sword. So anyway, we can't listen to it. But of course I would urge anyone who hasn't heard this song to go and listen to it. Um, because Great album. It's, it's, the whole album's amazing and in actual fact there's a song on there called Carrie which is the song that I would say is a kind of forever song for me it's a song that um reaches and rises to something that is about um a quality of timelessness and, evo and evocativeness that I don't find in all songs but this particular part of the lyric from Blue Blue here is a shell for you inside you'll hear a sigh a foggy lullaby there is your song from me. Now that is so simple and so endlessly beautiful, a foggy lullaby. There is your song from me. My goodness, if somebody wrote those words to me. <laughs> you would wilt. <laughs> <laughs> would I have what, a what, what? and a fan? <laughs> oh. Oh. Um. Uh, what is the song? Is the song the person existing? Well, I think that's what I like about this. And actually, it's why I found there to be some contention between you and I when we were talking about the love songs you put into the presentation you put together the other week. Is that there wasn't, I didn't find a sense of any of them really being about now <laughs> and yeah. um you know they were either about the past or they were about way in the future whereas yeah. with this writing this is about now and that now is relevant and relative to me not just to Joni Mitchell and I think that is so extraordinary and again I've, when we talk about art I talk about generosity and uh, I think this is about generosity, to give your listener, to give your reader, your understander a chance to feel like it's theirs, that they have it, that it is them. I don't know if I'm the person speaking or singing. I don't know if I'm the person receiving these beautiful words. And it doesn't actually matter. Again, there's no distinction for me. I, th I think the, the hard part is that writing songs about love in the future or love in the past is easier because, and this is going back to me and you and how different we are, they're, they're more easily defined oh, and delineated. Oh, yeah, see, you're, you're on the right and I'm on the left here. <laughs> um, but because when it really comes down to it, love in the moment is indefinable, vague. Um, 
It's like it's like trying to hold on to a cloud. The foggy lullaby. Yeah. Right. It's like it's like it's like you know that thing is there, but you can't touch it and you don't know its boundaries. You know? So it's difficult to talk about. I think it's difficult to write about or make music or art about because it's everything and nothing again. And like I was saying. Well, I mean, is this not the lifeblood of what we do, Bill? Everything and nothing. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, come on, you know, we are, I'm not going to say we are anything. I, I'm, I'm, go I'm going to say that um, the foggy lullaby, that vagueness that you do shy away from. Yep. Is the, is the zone of, like it's the wellspring, it's the thing that gives as much as takes, it's the thing that um, is, is source. I don't know how to put it. That, that, well, liminal, isn't it? Sure, yeah. I mean, in the wider song, the whole thing. Yep. I'm not gonna sing it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah give me some of that blue songs are like tattoos you know i've been to sea before crown and anchor me or let me sail away hey blue and there is a song for you ink on a pin underneath the skin an empty space to fill in well there are so many sinking now you've got to keep thinking you can make it through these waves Acid, booze, and ass, needles, guns, and grass, lots of laughs, lots of laughs. Everybody's saying that hell's the hippest way to go. Well, I don't think so. But I'm going to take a look around it through blue. I love you, blue. Here is a shell for you. Inside you'll hear a sigh, a foggy lullaby. There is your song for me. No, obviously, I mean, that's that's written down the way she sounds it out, the way yeah. she does sing it. Beautiful. Yeah. I, it's also interesting. I think that there is, and this is... Do you think that there is a a, a difference in the way... No, I'm not going to bring this up. This is dangerous, dangerous territory. Do you think that there is a feminine and a masculine way of looking at love in the moment? <laughs> Are you in the danger zone yet, Bill? Do yeah, I'm, I'm deep it in it. I, I'm, my, I'm up to my knees right now. Do you want to push it any further into the danger zone? No, I mean, do, do you do you think that there is a, do you think that there is a, Listen, there is there is the way that you in this moment right now, there is a way that you and I are experiencing this moment. And then in my worldview, there is a moment that exists separate from your your our independent experiences of it. There's an objective thing that's happening. There's how I'm experiencing it. There has uh, how you're experiencing it. There's the objective thing about it. There's the fact of what we're saying, isn't there? Is the fact yes but in 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 say this thing with joni mitchell there is her view of what the love is between her and this other person the other person might have a very different view of that same love i mean this is a very common thing in human relations yes it is uh -huh. um so why are we to trust either of them Well, I mean, this is ending up somewhere different than what you started asking, because I think you realized the treachery and what you were asking before. Um, well, I, I, I think that I, I, I realized that what I was asking before was irrelevant to the point I was trying to make. Hmm. Or there was, a, there was a more general way of putting it. Hmm. What are you actually asking, Bill? 
I'm asking when we read a poem or a lyric about how somebody perceives an experience they're having with someone else, why do we trust their experience over the other person's or why do we trust that they're telling the truth or that if their experience isn't just an illusion? And if it is an illusion, does that matter? Of course it doesn't matter. Right. To you. See, to me, it does matter. Like that distinction matters. Why does it need to be distinct? Why do we need to decide? You know, what, what is the purpose of all this decision? Well, in this particular case, I think that, that you're in a situation where uh, differences of perception, I don't know, can create, can, can create a mess that, that doesn't need to be there because the objective truth of the situation is, is, is ambiguous. And so people read into it how they want to read into it. It's like the fog of war or something like that. Back to the foggy lullaby. But you know, if you, um, if if one is not going to put conditions on love, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. wait, one is not going to put conditions on love. No conditions on love. Okay. Uh, then one has no need to feel as if that vagueness isn't part of the language of love. That vagueness is part of the, part of the fun. Oh, I'm not talking about fun. Well, I mean, part of the fun, not necessarily fun, but like is, is, is part and parcel of, of the, of the experience. You and I do see things very differently, Bill. Yes, I know. Mm -hmm. That's what makes our conversations interesting. But also I'm very aware, you know, I mean, when it comes to it in my actual real life, you know, this is in many ways, this is theorizing, this is dialogue between sure. friends. Um, I do know that, you know, there's this insistence that I have to really look at in myself where I want to make sure that things are kind of pinpointed in the right places. But to be so positional is actually to miss the point of anything that is about love. And actually that anything that is about love makes love sound like it's somehow separate to me. And of course it's not. I am the love I feel. Yes. Okay. I mean, like I, under I understand what you're saying. I just have a, a yeah. Okay. I, it's, 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 I don't know. It's, it's just the idea of experience in general. And I think love arguably is the, most extreme heightened example of human experience in a lot of ways. Um, the ambiguity of emotion. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I've just, I've just got to look at this for a minute with you is love and sure. experience. Yes, it is. If you really want to go down the, 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 the Bill Wadman is broken inside rabbit hole. I would argue that. <laughs> <laughs> Love is an emotion we have so that we make sure we make more babies. Well, you mentioned that before, you know, this is, this is very limiting, I would say. <laughs> I'm not saying that everything that humanity has built up on top of what is ultimately just a biological imperative is, has no meaning or that it isn't intense or that it doesn't define life in many ways, define our experience of living in many ways is a better way of putting it. Um, but I, but I think all of that is, is, is an illusion we we've chosen to believe in. Are you defined by the illusions you've created in place of what love is? Because love is not an external action, much as you might want it or need it to be. I think love is a lot of things. I think it's external and internal. I think it's, I think it's where, where you wouldn't want to define it. I would define it in multiple dimensions in multiple realms, but that's fine. I mean, that's, that's, you know, the way that we create our own 
structures in our heads about what our lives and our experiences are. Um, the scaffolding that we build. Hmm. Well, you know, we all have scaffolds, don't we? I mean, even in the even in this even in this song, even in this lyric, you know, here's a shell for you. It's just like I'm I'm, and then you're you know I'm I'm placing my song into this thing that I'm giving to you, but your experience of listening to that shell and that sound is not the same thing as me putting it into the shell. But hang on, you know, I think also it is right for me just to say here that, you know, I've chosen everything this evening for us to talk about because they have- Most of the time, you always choose everything. <laughs> and that's the way it should be. Um, <laughs> I, I would really like, to say that the things I've chosen tonight are things that are all very special to me and yeah. they're things that I return to, they're things that I think about um, and they're full of my own projections. They're all part of my own illusion and my grand yeah. illusions, of course, about myself and who I am. Uh, but in this, in this conversation that springs up between you and I about this, you know, we're coming back in about love again here. And very particularly, it seems that maybe we're thinking about romantic love. Now, that's obviously, uh, it's not an accident, but, you know, in many ways, it's also not the intention of looking at these things. They might be the point of the things themselves. Yep. But actually, you know, there are many other things I could say about, and I'm sure you could say as well, about not this external love that we feel that we ought to receive from somebody else. But well, you could argue that the, that the the meaning that we were discussing in the first poem is itself some sort of internal love structure. Well, I mean, I am no one. Yeah. I am no one. But I would, before we could just go on to the next one, I would like yeah. to just say something about here is a shell for you. Yeah. Now, if I wandered about and I could put my hand in my pocket and I could pull out a pebble or a shell, I would give a shell to you. Mm -hmm. And I would find all the people that I care about and I would give them all shells. And that very simple thing is about something really important in that we are crushed by the structures and scaffolds we build that are so complex. And yet here we are, the simplest thing. You're my friend. Here's a shell for you. Now, it's sung by Joni Mitchell as a love song to a lover. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it has to be. A foggy lullaby, that slumber, that sleepiness, that sense of connection and connectedness communality with a fellow human creature another creature that i feel warmth towards here's a shell for you how simple how beautiful do, do you imagine in that scenario that you are giving the shell to someone else so that they know that you care about them or so that no it's the curious thing no, hold, hold on hold on so hold on a second i haven't got the other half so either either that they know that you care about them or so that you have externalized the feeling you have regardless of how they take it in the end. So that you know that you care about them enough to give them a shell. Does that, does that you understand the distinction? I do, but I think that's an incredibly complicated way to go back to thinking about something so simple. I don't uh, see, hope, I think I don't hope for anything through the exchange of the shell. This is this is I mean this goes back to, you know, <laughs> why I don't dig too deeply about thoughts about life because I want, yes, you're right. They are incredibly simple things, but they are incredibly complex bundles of things with a simple shell around them. Bill, I just, as an anecdote, I have a, I have a, a person who I would like to think of as a friend who I've known for quite a while. And she strikes me as being very, very special. And, um, I was making something. I was making an origami flower <laughs> with an origami master. And I was being a very good student because I am a very good student. I'm, you know, put my hand up and we've made a joke about this before. You know, I'd be sitting at the front, right in the yeah. teacher's face. I'd want to get everything. Nerd. Back. Yeah. 
you can talk. Um, and anyway, I'd made an origami flower and it had just about killed me because it had to be precise and the master was very, very particular. Anyway, I made the origami flower and I saw this person and I gave her the origami flower. And in that moment, it was absolutely for her. The origami flower that I had toiled over was suddenly this thing that I simply wanted to give. Now, I didn't load it up as a symbol of love or friendship, but of course there was love and friendship in the flower. Mm -hmm. And in giving it, I don't think I gave away love and friendship. And I don't think I necessarily created love and friendship, but the simple act of giving something that was humble, yep. even though it killed me to make it so precisely. All the discarded sheets of paper. Here is this one flower. It was so, so simple. And I didn't seek anything in having made the flower. What I mean is that I didn't intend to give the flower to the person. I didn't know it until it happened. And I think that, you know, where there has been no intention, but there has been an act that is genuine, that that is no bond, it is no alignment, it is no material form anymore. It doesn't put us together in a team or a club, but nonetheless, it was something of great importance that I, in that sure. moment, gave that flower. This is a ramble, but there's something in this. Here is a shell for you. Anyway, Bill, if I was in Brooklyn right now, I'd give you a shell. Oh, I'd take it. Oh. I, you know, I listen, I'm giving you a hard time, but, you know, this is a, this is a thing that my friend Mara had on a tree in the year 1994. Yeah. And I have it here next to me on my desk. So like, I, I am a believer in small oh, you're symbols. So old is one thing. <laughs> yes, I am. But, but, but that's, but see, so it's not that I'm not on the same train as you. Oh. I just, no, like I'm, I'm there with you. I like, like I tell you I'm a cynical romantic, right? Like I, I am a romantic. I just, get sucked into trying to understand it on a deeper level so that I'm not sad about it. But, uh, you know, I admire the quest for meaning. I do. I've been obsessed with the quest for meaning pretty much my entire life. And I sometimes think what folly it has been. What yep. am I really looking for here? Why am I looking? I am. True. Hmm. True. Anyway, this is All right, very, what's the next one? Very small, very short. It's from one of my most favorite books in that I read this book and I've read a lot of Steinbeck. I mean, it was on our syllabus in school. Um, and unlike many of my cohort, my classmates, I didn't resist Steinbeck, I think a lot of people resist set texts in school right. and then they don't become necessarily beloved or favorites, but a lot of Steinbeck's work became swiftly something, books that I would return to, to read again and again, in the same way that Blue I could play over and over <laughs> and over and I could listen or read Cummings' poems again and again and each time I yield, I yield to them and they yield back to me, they, there's a reciprocity. All great and precious things are lonely. Mm. And I think that's an interesting quote actually to come up upon right at this point. Because I'm not trying to make you feel miserable, Bill, but I wonder if this does. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is the black hole that I'm most afraid of. Isn't it funny that the things I find so absolutely and profoundly 
beautiful and in so many ways comforting <laughs> it's like the abyss for you yes that's exactly what it is it's because you these statements like this are are exactly what you're looking for you're looking for something that you couldn't put into boxes if you tried but it, to me this is a, a statement that is impossible to break down and put into boxes. So it's terrifying <laughs> for me while comforting to you. So, I mean, it's spoken by um, the character Lee in East of Eden. And East of Eden, many people watching will have read. Um, you know, as a novel, it was, I think one of the first novels I read where I really, I mean, Scottish syllabus for literature class was, was very heavy, I would say. I mean, we did a lot of Scottish literature we did Lewis Grassic Gibbon. We looked at Sunset Song over and over. I mean, when you're 14, reading about incest and rape, marital rape, and the bleakness of an Aberdeenshire farming community, you know, sometimes Steinbeck, you know, it's like the great American myth was not that dissimilar to some of the the, the darkness that one might find in these Scottish texts, except it was California and the sun was shining. Yeah. That was the only difference. But anyway, Lee in East of Eden is this very, very important supporting character. Um, he pops up as a, almost like a device, I suppose, of um, balancing, balancing family ties maybe, but he also is, I guess, well, I suppose all of them in some way or another are cast as philosophers. Um, but he says this, I think, in conversation with Sam Hamilton. I can't remember. But if somebody he... said something like this to you in general conversation, would you would you bump on it? Would you stop? Or would it feel like they were quoting something else? Like this is this is this is this is an amazing sentence. But it feels like the kind of sentence that if somebody said it in person in a conversation, it would be like, where did you get that? <laughs> Were you reading Steinbeck again? People do say things like this all the time, Bill. You say Yeah, it's really good. Like you say nah. things. You do. I mean, if I watch over all the things we've ever talked about. Yeah. You know, I'm there with my notepad. There's your notepad. My, my notepad's right there. Yeah. You know, I think we all have the capacity to be profound. Yeah. And sometimes when you're not being self-conscious, with all due respect, you say the most profound things. Now, hmm. if someone said to me in conversation, all oh, great and <laughs> precious things are lonely, maybe I'm just very, very lucky some people might consider it very unlucky, but I do have friends that You're might like, say, I know people who would say stuff like I this. Do. I have people around me who would say things like <laughs> this and it would be completely normal. And yeah. actually, you know, I'm a bit of a legend in my own lunchtime. I might even say something <laughs> like this and don't make fun of it because again, I come back to you and I say, you might say something like this. In fact, you might say something like this to me. Wait, is, is legend in your own lunchtime a British or a Scottish thing? Because that's not an American thing. I don't know. Okay. Anyway. It's great. I love it. Go ahead. Okay. I, I love the fact that you have identified this as something that cannot be broken apart. No, it's this is like a divide by zero sentence. Yes, it's a root. Yeah, it's a it's, source. It's uncomfortable. It's beautiful. It's and true and it's sad and it's ultimately, this is the kind of, listen, and I'm saying this as a man who is happily married. This is the kind of stuff that I would think when I lived alone that would make me think that I would always be alone. Do you not think you are always alone, Bill? Um, I am very much alone 
yeah, ultimately we all die alone, right? Mm -hmm. But I think for most of us, you know, we actually, is there, is there not cause to get to grips with the fact that we are alone? Yeah. Mm. And even in the sanctity of a very happy marriage or a very deep friendship or a close familial tie, We, we are alone, you know? Do you seek permanence in other people? No. <laughs> let, 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 me, let, me, let me rephrase that. Um, you know, you and I have known each other for whatever, eight months or whatever now, right? Not long. Um, yeah, not long. Um, and we've never met in person. The best we do is when we're talking here, like all of you are watching. You and I are now friends. I consider us pretty good friends from doing this all the time and talking a bit offline. A bit? Are you talking about like the avalanche of text messages and... Well, yeah. But, <laughs> but if I were to suddenly leave your life for some reason or you left mine, I would feel like there was a hole there because we've created dents in each other's lives. Does that make sense? It would be sad if if we disappeared. I would be. Sad. I don't think anybody who has somebody else, friend, lover, whatever you know what I mean, to like put it in in the in, in the in the in the continuum. I don't think anybody wants that to end. But of course, we all know that it will end. So in the end, yes, we are all alone. But we have the fantasy that for a time we're not alone, because being alone is scary yeah and we seek permanence we do seek permanence you know i think when we're not paying close attention to what is what's happening what is now yeah. um you know i do it myself I'm, I, I do it all the time have to i really have to catch myself on with this because this fixation and this fixation on fixing on something as being permanent and again this idea of being in the future i mean that's just mad isn't it Thinking, I, I am generally of the opinion that thinking any more than, you know, tonight in the future tends to be folly. You do. And yet here you were giving us songs the other week that were about thinking way into the future. And you actually said to me something that is one of the most alarming things you've ever said, <laughs> which, is, <laughs> which was along the lines of, I want to make sure that it was something like, I want to imagine the future so that I can think about looking back at now and feeling happy about it. So you were going to like two different time locations to appreciate now. Yeah, I, I, it's actually, well, yes, I, I may have said that. My, my the, a better way to put it is that <laughs> I, I worry that in the future, I am going to regret not having done something in the past. And, and to, to your point, that might be something as simple as giving someone a shell. So, but you know, I, I mean, do you not perhaps think that, you know, if you really want to, I'm getting better at this, I think, as I get older. Okay. Which is that if I really want to, and I'm being, I, I'm, I'm understanding that I want to do something. I'm so much more likely just to do it. Whereas that caution I would have felt when I was younger, I've I realized that I've wasted time. And of course I haven't wasted time because I've lived my life and all those things. No, but, but you only have so much of it. You wasted some of it. It's gonna happen, it's inevitable, but go ahead. No, no, look, look at even what I'm saying. Isn't, isn't this so dangerous? How much um, judgment there is? Yeah. In the use ourselves. of time? My goodness. Sure. We're using time all the time. I mean, anyway, listen, it's, it's, it's the one thing you can't get more of. Go ahead. These, these, this little loose seeming collection, again, is a curation of things that I have found sustaining and beautiful and have had some kind of, if not profound effect, well, yes, profound effect on me 
in my life for a variety of reasons. I think the reasons they've affected me is not particularly interesting to anyone else, but I know what they are. Um, and I wanted to, as much as possible, just say that, you know, you can go online and you can type in like quotes by Steinbeck and there are lots of things on Pinterest, you know, people pin quotes a sure. lot on Pinterest. And that's fine. But really, I can't fit the whole of East of Eden on this slide. But if I could, I would. Um, because these things do live. They are alive in the same way that I talk about the past being alive. Um, these things are alive in me. I don't know if that's because I've been given a gift by their makers, their creators. Yep. I know it's not a gift specifically for me. I don't know these people. But I feel as if there's a true abundance in my understanding of these things. And as such, they've really inspired me. To write? To, to write, to... I'm, I'm, I, was, I was prompting you for, oh, for yes. well, number four. So to finish... Um, I do write and these things have inspired me and mm -hmm. it's not because I think of course for any second that I'm E.E. E. Cummings or Joni Mitchell or John Steinbeck sure mm -hmm. you are you're all of them and more <laughs> but I am Sandy Robertson yes you are so to finish I'm going to read something and wait can, can, be, before you read it can I just ask a question Mm -hmm. when, when we're done with this, are we analyzing what you've written or are we letting it, or, or is this just how we're ending the show? Because it'll change the way I listen and think about this. You can say whatever you like, Bill. Okay. All right, you ready? I, go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt. <laughs> so that shipwreck night. I was marooned, small, tired upon the shore. You marauded. Cutlass in hand, searching the shells for the sound of the sea, the hand tattooed with stones of every port. Now storied ourselves like some great lovers, stars confer upon our fate, bringing us together to dance. To dance, a fluid step and turn, you lift me up. My face, silver, cast, we both cast away. That shipwrecked night, the sea, at sea, you cried happy and mad, the ocean roaring back, some great comrade turncoat waves giving to take and below deck the wrecked lie. The ocean floor littered with our trinkets, full of water, foolish things. The horizon shattered by light, first light. I cried, the tears, the salt, the cheek kissed. You understand and I stay next to you, memories of land, Mother, father, far, far away. A land of plenty, a loamy gift. Not here, sand and sand and water, rocks. A face, I see a face and it is yours. Dawn coming, recalcitrance useless. We'll have oysters come daybreak, you said, tongue twisted with lust. And I pull barnacles from your feet, fierce and pirate come undone by worn souls. Your boots, the laces left untied, you never learned. Drenched in rum, you lay, waiting. Like the snake, breeches stripped instead of scaled, eyeing me, toying with the thought. A siren, you might believe, eyes glancing as sun rises, disappeared, with closing lids taken under by the promise of another lover. The sound of water, the sound of song, sung by the fishwives and the girls at the harbour, Set sail as recollections, fragments only, belly down. The fractured thought of them, a curse, the snake moving, the flag rising, a ghost ship. Yet you, sweet invincible, wild tirade of self-assurance, your pain never came because you easily forget. Yet mine is mine, always my pain, not soaked, not drowned, a shard piercing. 
the ears hooked in gold, the chest open, pillaged, heart beating with no mercy from the elements, your lopsided smile, a smile of every man, a grand display of treasure, of possession upon the lonely rock. My diffidence, worries swelled the ocean, huge crest and raging wall of water, the sun rising to burn us, the boat a distant blur. <laughs> when you're writing something like that does it come out of you or does it take work it just comes out do you handwrite or type either whatever is there But I'm, I do think I'm envious of that skill. I do think that, you know, it's a fashion of experience, a fashioning of all these things I've shared already tonight comes into that poem, as well as all other things that I might think and feel. And it might not be worded perfectly and certainly, you know, some creative writing course leader will be, you know, freaking out at the quality or lack of quality of what is written, maybe. But it is genuinely that idea you started with earlier. And again, I can't remember if it was on take one or if it's in take two, where words collide together to form these impressions. An impression. It's an impression of my life. Do you think about your day-to-day -day life that way? Do you imagine these, um, this stream of conscious images goes through you as you're experiencing the world? Does that make sense? Like, um, I imagine that that your life in your head is an ongoing poem of that meter. Is it? Yeah, I would say so. That's intense. No, I mean, we all think we're comprised of these different parts. Yeah. But everything blurs. Everything True. Is one thing. True. If I live my life like that poem. <laughs> well, what am I saying? I have lived my life like that poem. <laughs> anyway, Bill, you're very kind to listen to me. I am proud to be your friend and would listen to you read anything you ever write <laughs> yet more evidence of your actual lunacy um <laughs> <laughs> well i'm not sure what we've done this evening but i've enjoyed it i i think it'll be very interesting to see how this one is is accepted or rejected uh, <laughs> thought thought of by our listenership is listenership a word? Viewership? I don't know. But if you are watching and you are listening and you have heard, oh, don't be a troll. Be kind. Yeah. And smash that like button and comment below. <laughs> Bill, let's hope we can meet next week. Two weeks is too long. I have to get an air flight to England in the next five days. No, I mean, so oh, you mean online? <laughs> yes, uh, yeah, I fried I your brain that much this evening. I it's 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 been an intense evening, I have to admit. You take it to all other places, and I love it. Thank you. Thank you. This was fun. Bye, Bill. Bye.